Anyone out there a writer? Does anyone enjoy writing stories? We got Gail, a couple, a couple of hands going like this. If you were the one called to write the biography of Jesus, like, like, like if God said, I want you to tell the most important story anyone could tell, the, enti- the good news, where would you start? Like, like Christmas makes a lot of sense because that's the beginning of Jesus, right? But we're all going to get there eventually. Um, you might start, most biographies start with, with a family, like where they came from. And, and that's, in fact, that's what Matthew does. He starts with a family. Mark starts when Jesus starts working, like right at the beginning of when Jesus says, here's what I'm doing. Uh, the Lord is on me. And John the Baptist says, look at him. Okay, that's, that's a good place to start. John, you can, you can fact check me all you want. You can look in your Bibles here. Um, John, he, he starts in a weird place. Like it's, he says in the beginning, and he means like in the, the beginning, the very beginning, beginning. Um, so he's kind of a weirdo, though, uh, which leaves Luke. Luke claims to be a historian, but he starts where, right where Pat read. It is totally out in left field. Uh, this is Jesus's maybe second uncle, relative of some kind. He's just going to work on a regular day in 4 BCE. There's nothing special about it. This story has nothing to do with Jesus, right? Did, did anyone sense any Jesus in this story? Like, like, what's it? Many of you have heard this story during Advent for years. Every few years, this one pops up to begin Advent. And you may have wondered, what the heck does this have to do with Christmas? Right here. Well... Let me tell you a little bit more about our friend, Zechariah. Zechariah was a priest, but in those days, a a priest was not a full-time job. Uh, He did not serve a congregation like like I I do, and I'm not a priest, but Hebrew priests, their, their priestliness was to work at the temple about two weeks a year. That was their calling. They had two weeks to go to the temple. All the rest of the year, 50 weeks a year, six days a week, 24 hours a day, they did, they were farmers, or they built houses, or they, they ran a restaurant. They did whatever their jobs were. And Zechariah worked all year, every year. He's a little older. Let's say, you know, he's, he's a little older than he expects to become a parent. So let's say he's like 50 or 55 years old, something like that. This is, in this region, like, no one's had a midlife crisis yet. We had to get to, like, at least, I don't know, 1995 to have midlife crisis. I don't know. (laughs) But he's he's old enough to be kind of worn down by life, ground down by the routine of farming every day, getting up for work. He's out in this, he lives in this little village in the middle of the desert, the kind of a community where, I, I don't know if the well is going to have water today, if it's going to be good water today. I don't, I don't know who's going to be selling at the market today. But then two weeks a year, he gets to go to the temple where his whole job, he doesn't have to pull water for the sheep, he doesn't have to build a house, he doesn't have to work 10 hours a day. His job is to pray. That's it. That's his job. And he gets to go to the big city, with, you know, without all those other responsibilities. The hardest thing that a priest would do in these two weeks, like the, the most difficult task, is barbecue. Nice. Yeah, yeah, that's the hardest thing he would do is he would help people with their, their sacrifices. He would help cook them. He, he would just grill, uh, like goats and doves and, and cows. And then he would eat barbecue to his heart's content. Anyone want to sign up to be a Hebrew priest? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like, I'm a vegetarian. Still sounds great. We'll just barbecue some tofu or something. But, but these other 50 weeks, other than this, this really beautiful vacation here, these other 50 weeks, where he's coming from before the story, and where he knows he's going back after the story, can we just acknowledge that the guy was tired? His life, he must have been tired of doing this same hard work all the time. Same back-breaking work, the same pressure of responsibilities, the same feeling that this is my life and there's no other way out. There's no other options. These are the people who I'm responsible for. People get tired. People need rest. And rest is recuperate. I was talking to someone today how their vacation was. Well, it wasn't that restful. How was the break? You know, you think about your day in the middle of the day. You, you have a break. What do you do on your break? You go look at your phone? Do you do some business? Do you send some emails on your break? Is that recuperating? People need to have these times to build energy in. What we need is rest when we are weary. Number two thing about Zechariah, he had some stuff at home. He had some heavy family issues going on. 
We don't know in this story how he felt, how Elizabeth felt. We don't know if they had been, you know, talking about it or fighting about it. If they, maybe they had worked through it when they were, like, decades ago, and now they're just totally fine with everything that's happened in their life. We don't know if their relationship was strained or strong. We don't know if other people kind of judged them for their issues at home, because everyone has different issues at home, and the world then and the world now will judge you for the slightest bit of difference. And they might have dealt with that great. We don't know. There are no hints about how he felt right then, but we do know Every relationship at some point has its difficulty. And every relationship that is weighted with some deeper trauma opens up these moments of truth that defines how the future is going to be. For these two, Elizabeth and uh, Zechariah, we know that at some point in their life, they have been on the edge of emotional exhaustion, just beat down by life. So can we acknowledge that Zechariah's personal life had been hard because loss is hard, shame is hard, blame is hard. The very risk of loving and being loved is so hard. So somewhere in their story, there had been pain. And when we hurt, we need comfort. We need relief. We don't just need a break. We don't just need someone to solve the problem, like whatever that funny noise is that's going on over there. Yeah. Well, that'd be a great problem to solve, I guess, right now. It could be a cat in the piano. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Something's making noise over there. Yeah, but we don't. Sometimes more than just solving a problem, what our hearts need is true healing. We need this process from outside and from inside. That when we are weary, we need healing. So third, Zechariah lived in a place surrounded by turmoil and unknown and chaos. These were Jews living in a time of an occupied Roman force, occupied by like military police everywhere. Now, thank God that the, the Caesar at that time, he let them live in, it let them worship in the temple, at least for, for now, that was going to be taken away soon enough. Because otherwise, they lived with a constant threat of capricious and cruel rulers. Now, you can call that politics if you want to minimize the real weight of their situation at all times, but they did not know, day by day, year by year, they did not know, will I be able to own this home? Uh, will my relatives be able to be who they are tomorrow, or will there be some oppression on them? They, they heard the Romans talk about religious freedom, but it sure felt like if you didn't worship their gods, you weren't very free to do anything religiously. And the oppression must have been so draining. Uh, that hearing their Roman neighbors who supported that agenda must have been so numbing. And the chaos of who might be the next ruler, who might be the next Herod, and what awful things they would do, I'm sure none of you have ever worried about that. But for Zechariah, when he was at this altar making an incense offering, so, so our, our Bible, this is one of these weird Jewish words, incense offering. Our Bible study recently, a few weeks ago, we were looking through, like these, the, the Bible lists all these crazy offerings, and they just look the same to us. They mean, they're, to us, it's just offerings and offering. Um, and different rabbis were like, well, this offering's for this, and this offering is for this. Eventually, several years after Jesus' time, there's a rabbi who sets it down that this incense offering, what the point of that is, is first of, all, first of all, about mercy for how we talk to each other. That's how uh, Zohar defines the incense offering, as though their society had ever just been bickering too much. They needed a special offering for bickering too much. And by extension, this, uh, this, this incense offering was about recreating cohesion in a divided society. Does that sound like anything we would want in our world today? In their world of political turmoil, some act of calming aggression, some act of inviting a way through the chaos would be amazing. So we don't know exactly what Zechariah said at this time, but it's a good bet that it's here or sometimes he prayed to God. He said, God, your prophets promised justice. You, God, claimed that you would do something about this. You promised you would send a Messiah to set the wrongs right. So please, can you, can you get us through this mess that we're living in? So can we acknowledge that Zechariah may have been out of energy for how to face the onslaught of social disorder? He had resisted. 
He had done what he could. He's, an, he's, you know, he's not an older man, but he's, he's a man who's like spent so much energy trying to make the world a better place because he wants the younger generation to have a better place to live, and he's just exhausted from it. And when our spirits are so weary with bad news, we need a new vision. When, when we run out of solutions, we need a new vision. Exhausted, heartbroken, and in despair, and that is exactly where God shows up, with rest, with healing, and with new life. And see, this is a story about Jesus, because that's what Jesus does. We hear this story before Christmas every few years, and most of my life, I, that ending of the story is he comes out speechless as though it's some kind of punishment. It's really e easy to read that story and hear that the angel punishes him for some lack of faith or something. But I hear the story now that Zechariah is just so amazed that God finally shows up. He doesn't even know how to respond when God finally shows up. His hope had been so weathered by the years that when he catches a glimpse of light in the shadows, he's just in awe. Now, Nick Cave said in an interview this week, anyone who might listen to On Being may have heard this, but Nick Cave is an Australian musician who lost two, two teenage sons a couple years apart. And it shocked his songwriting, so it took away his, his job for a while. You can imagine it took him a good while until he could see through the fog. It took him even longer until he could talk about it with people. It took a really long time until he could kind of be on stage and, and use his, his grief and hope and, and turn that back into art. But eventually last week he said, and I quote him, it is the audacity of the world to continue to be beautiful and to continue to be good in times of deep suffering. It is an audacity of the world to have such beauty, even when we feel so ruined by life. And if you choose to see it, that's the work of Jesus, and that's the story of Jesus. And C Cave goes on. It's beautiful that his, his real name, he's not one of these musicians who changes his name. His, na his last name is Cave, which it's like he's being invited out of this cave of grief. It's like he's being invited out of this tomb of despair. It is like he's uh, being welcomed and given unto resurrection. And Cave says, people are suffering so deeply and the temptation is to cling to those absences, to sort of tuck yourself around the lack of something rather than turning yourself out and looking at the world. And that can be dangerous. That can become a hardening of your soul. And instead, God reached into Zechariah who was experiencing this beginnings of a hardening of a soul and offering something soft. And God reaches to us to remind our souls to feel rest, healing, and hope. And God reaches into our souls so we might feel amazement without a need to describe it. Sometimes God's reach means filling those voids in our life, and sometimes it means moving away from those voids. And sometimes it's so complicated that it is about enriching our lives through the empty tomb when we're ready for that. And that's how the story of Jesus begins. That's how the story of Jesus ends. That's how the story of Jesus touches our life. Not a trite command to just be happy in the face of real life. It's not an expectation or some rule that we, like, have your sadness, have your happiness, and feel guilty about it. This is God showing up when we need it most. And sometimes that is with us in the pit of despair, and sometimes that is in this glint of laughter, the first time you laugh after a deep trauma, when you feel almost, am I allowed to laugh still? And sometimes God shows up by narrowing our perspective right into the depth of significance of what has happened to us. And sometimes God shows up by allowing us to zoom out and see what else is in the frame of reference. And when that happens, and it might take years, that speechless wonder can move to a hard-earned smile. And that recovery of your measure of who you are can become even more toward rejoicing. How does a weary world rejoice? First, by acknowledging our weariness and welcoming God into the story. May it be so.